So yeah, I'll get rolling and describe as I go what I'm doing. I'm gonna set up the action line as a kind of long pivot or axis on the entire subject matter. And that is something that I try to do a lot because I feel like it gives me something to immediately grab onto and carry for a period of time. And at the very least, sometimes when things don't go as well as I want, I've got the opportunity to look back at that axis and wonder whether or not I should have exaggerated it or pulled it to a different extent or pushed it or somehow adulterated the original concept because I wasn't seeing well enough. You can see how that guides the marks already and it's probably not even going to be readable as a foot for a period of time because I don't really want to read this as a foot just yet. It's more important that it be engaging and interesting and fulfilling that it looked like a human foot for the immediate future. There is something that we touched on last week in the workshop, the beauty of the line. And the line has to carry a lot in it. It needs to build in a certain way and lay out a kind of aesthetic precedent so that you can go back into it and kind of mess around with it. And when we say beauty, we're not talking about a sinuous, perfect, lyrical line. We're in a sense, we're talking about a line that's perfectly suited to its purpose. The purpose here being the lay-in. Maybe that's the part of not getting lost. The initial mark that I placed was what's underneath of that in the photograph. So this is intended to be the base. I've gotten myself interested in drawing that because not only is it the physical end, the limit of the form, but drawing this in a larger setting, oftentimes with a class, an in-house or an in-person class, has led me to bring that into the conversation more times than, than not because sometimes the plinth or the support structure is a very convenient reference that isn't utilized. I like it here because it's so close in proximity to what we would regard as the physical foot. And so I'm using that as the initiator. And then what happens after that is a sort of mark that just kind of takes everything into account and pulls it forward. You can see from the photograph that there's a, almost an elliptical it's like an encircling or a circumference right. type of mark that goes in and lays out a few things. And it's just going to be a holding mark. You just want an initial conversation starter because if you get something rolling, then there's a lot of opportunity to refine it or to build it or to reinterpret it. And I think that's one of the magical things about drawing. As long as you don't lose your head or your foot and you can hold on to the thought, usually you're, you're okay because I've got this thing that I'm always after and that is structural opportunism. We also touched upon the idea of sight sizing last week and sight sizing is a very interesting concept and I'm not opposed to it. But the issue I think with sight sizing isn't so much a copy mentality. First of all, what is sight sizing? It's pretty simple. It's the size you see your subject matter, the exact optical translation like one to one. So you'd set up next to the subject matter and it would be the same size. That's sight sizing. And I tend to almost never do that. And the reason is I'm scaling up on the page because the bigger I can get my subject matter, the more I can access the forms within. That's why I said structural opportunism because it's very opportunistic to enlarge. And I'm always finding myself advising people in my class to do that because I want them to be able to explore pelvises and not to sit on a form that's so tiny that they wouldn't be able to indulge in the search that you want to get into to figure things out. So I enlarge because I'm interested in enlarging whenever I get the opportunity. And I really have found drawing over life size something I really enjoy. When you try to fill a space, you may not be able to see the whole paper here, but we have this phrase called justifying the rectangle. And if you've ever tried these compositional exercises, you know that you have to put something into a, an enclosure or what's also called a field that makes it look like that was the right ratio or scale or 
somehow format that fit that subject matter. That's justifying the rectangle. It is absolutely a more optically driven pursuit. And the best reason of all, aside from the fact that you have to draw what's up there in front of you first before you analyze it, is the fact that you're studying this interharmonic relationship. And if you just bypass that and build a, a constructive foot, believe me, I'm a proponent of building constructive feet. If ever there was one on this planet, I just really am interested in trying to sync that up with what you see in front of you, partially because of these interharmonic relationships. So as I put these lines in, you can see I'm reaching and I'm reaching, and this is more like extending a helping hand to an auxiliary form or a colleague in the same family. It really is like that because the elements that make this foot heroic are not just located here, they're located throughout. It's a sort of prevailing formal concept that you see as the forms pop and as they pull inward. And you wouldn't see that in a, in a kind of beautiful, more serpentine foot, a delicate foot. This is a foot that you would never want to get hit with in karate class. It's got that characteristic. We're using this and this and these and all sorts of measures to try to make everything connect to everything else. So that would go to the ongoing pursuit of making sure that this larger than life size foot feels like it fits together. Pointing the foot is a different thing when you draw the fleshy outer foot, the foot from life, the foot from the living figure, so to speak, than it would be in an anatomical setting. Because in an anatomical or cadaver setting, you get access to these kinds of forms and through here. And they have very prominent and intriguing pointing mechanisms in them, which make you think about where it's going and how to set up an axis for the foot, especially if you separate the foot from the rest of the, the ankle and so on and so forth. In the living figure, I think this marker between what's called the great toe, which is this one, and the rest of the toes is an excellent place to get into and try to access because it'll give you more to, to think about as you go through the process in terms of making the foot turn in a certain way. It's one of the issues that people run into in life drawing is trying to get the foot to feel like it belongs to the model stand and that it also belongs to the body that's attached to it. There's always lots of struggle with that. One of those ongoing things that artists have a lot of trouble with and I think it really just comes from not looking at it enough and not separating it out and identifying it as an independent discipline to master. It's so interesting, isn't it? I think of it sometimes like a kickstand on a motorcycle. And I say that because it seems like a lot of those motorcycle kickstands, they drop down and then they splinter into a set of three. And that's what the foot feels like. It's like a splintering of weight into a compartmentalized, amazingly dynamic thing, very thought-provoking, that keeps you guessing. And I really like the idea of staying in guess mode because if it was so simple, it would almost be like a no-brainer. You just pop the foot in. But for some reason, it has become a lot more about identifying the weight as this elusive force or phenomenon in the body that seems to go its own way as it veers toward the markers that set it on the ground plane because they are different weight-bearing surfaces and you know, constructions. Occasionally on break to ask somebody not to continue to look at the figure but to look at the tape marks because tape marks can be very telling about the perspective of the foot on the ground plane. I'm adding a few markers. You can see this is a pretty big deal. This one here, it's gonna stay as linear as possible. So if you take a look at the photograph, this isn't gonna be a very dark mark in the photo. It nevertheless feels quite important. So I'm gonna put it in there and I'm gonna lay it next to a mark that is darker in the photograph. If you take a look at this, you'll be able to see it. And I'm laying this in and trying to focus on the beauty of the mark a bit as well as the idea that it's probably not entirely parallel to that one. Do you see that? There's a bit of a difference there. My overriding interest is to develop something that I can work with that's kind of malleable. They are made, they're created, and they're edited down like this in order to ebb and flow and kind of make breathing spaces happen in the drawing. And so if I'm moving stuff around, I am not thinking to myself, Boy, I wish that I'd gotten that right, or this is so wrong, or something like that. I'm just trying to explore where the give and take is in the drawing, because there's always give and take. There's give and take in the perspective, and there's give and take in the focus and focal point. 
in the proportion and everything else. So I want to float that as an idea that could be helpful to you, the armature idea. I keep going back to the Opdyke quote from Art and Nature Appreciation, 1933. He says, it is in the relations where the quality lies, and the finer the relations, the finer the art. It's beautiful editing and an opportunity to create breathing spaces so you can refine the overall relationship of forms and uh, carve out a space to do so every time. I'm a big advocate of not allowing parts of the design to just linger because the more they sort of get left alone, the less they relate, the less they harmonize with what you're doing elsewhere. It's also, I think, a fairly healthy way to keep your eye refreshed because there are parts of what we've just done down there that really need a rest for my eye so that I can go back to it later, especially if I've got issues with the drawing down here, which I do. I owe it to myself to allow my eye to just take a quick break and then come back to it because I might be able to see it with a fresh eye more effectively in a moment. Each and every one of these prominences is going to have not only a meaning for the harmony as we've already covered, but also a particularly amazing, interesting anatomical relationship. It isn't sourced from the anatomy directly, it's based on a true story. I'm probably going to be identifying the tibia as doing something more like that. And that's the kind of control over placement that you have through the edit. Hopefully you find that helpful. That is interesting stuff, isn't it? I was working the instep. I was pushing on the instep right there. So as far over as I could take it to the visual left would create more of this kind of idea of not just a a line, a C-curve, or an arch, but a more flamboyant arch. When I say that, I mean something that's much more aesthetically self-conscious or something like that. That idea of the beauty of the foot, the beauty of the line. I'm going to go into the marker for the foot and add something that I don't see, and that would be something here. And you see what that'll do? It'll create a nice grounded sense of your overall foot, which is, once again, very interesting because it doesn't exist and we're talking in many ways about adding what you know is occurring. You know it has to settle. You know it has to feel alive and stabilized, but sometimes you need a kind of interpretive graphic system to get you there in addition to what's actually going on. That's a beautiful mark. I'll underscore that. It seems to me as though what's missing is a true appreciation of what's going on through this hard-won long-term study the poetics of the form, you know, the way the body is built and, and all of that kind of stuff, which to me is just, it goes to the absolute core of why it's worth doing. I would hate to think about bypassing that and trying to recreate without understanding what is actually going on.
I've got a number of different accents and placements, and what is abundantly clear to me is that there's a kind of roll backwards. You may see that already, but it is curious. It's almost architectural how these pieces of the form are pulling back in space like a set of stairs or something. And having that as a guiding force in interpreting what's going on, I think is quite important because if I was drawing the shape and the shape alone, it isn't going to deliver this necessarily. I think there's a recognition in your aesthetic sense, your hierarchy as you build a drawing that you want to prop up certain features within things. It could yeah. be as simple as an aspect of a color in a painting that you just don't want to lose. You know, or a temperature, like if you're painting a sunset and the sun just goes in this magical place and then it changes and you don't want to shift it. I think that that idea repeating in this zone here is one of the elements. I'm talking about this and this and that. That's one of the elements of the classical foot because you get a, so there's a subform here. I'm tracing it out with my pencil. You see that? And essentially what that is, is a lift. If I draw in a midline right here and I shift over and then I drop down again, that's the device, you see. That's the, the concept and the construct that would drive your thinking. It's just a neat thing. It's almost like fists with your toes, but it's so cool. And you don't see that in the human foot typically. It's very much in the idealized foot. It has expression, but it has solidity too. And it won't work if it turns into beautiful shape with no substance. I regard drawing as more adventurism than anything else. So when I put that in, and I try to find that front. You see how the front really is this kind of upright wall, so to speak. And if I put that identifier mark in the really incredible, impressive second toe, jutting out far in front of the first toe, I not only have an opportunity to see how the foot is turning as it's depicted in the drawing, but also there's a lead into the axis of all of that. And then I get a different line. So I'm going to go into the front or that blunt edge front plane of this toe. Do you see this mark right here I'm going really dark with it? I'm trying to use that to oppose the nail. This is the nail or the nail bed. And that to me is indicative of a twist for the great toe. And that's just another really cool thing. If the great toe can move distally and twist inward toward this axial core, then maybe there's an opportunity to see how the rest of the digits turn inward as well. So there's a kind of collision in that. And that can make foot drawing really engaging. I'm finding a place where the marks that I would be using now are going to maneuver their way into ever more structural arrangement, alignment, accuracy. When I say accuracy, I mean more of a proportional harmonic sense than just about anything else. And there's still a lot of breathing space in here to be able to do that, which I think is an important thing to point out because I embrace that. I recognize that not all the spaces are working just yet, 
but it's more important for me to lay out the phase of the drawing than just about anything else because I'm still going to push and pull and try to maneuver through these lines and use these edges to try to foster a, a more emotive sense, something that makes you feel the weight. I still feel like the idea of us drawing is to use a sensibility for empathizing with the person on the model stand for lack of a better phrase. You are a person, you understand where the pressure is and a camera doesn't. And I don't think an AI is gonna understand it either. And so when you get involved in that, you sort of channel that in a way through the marks that you make, which makes it much more personalized, organic, because you're gonna read the weight differently than somebody else's when they're looking at the same pose. But if you tune into that, I think it's far more effective for drawing because you'll retain a sense of liveliness. And that's, kind of overriding issue. That's the bulwark that pushes back against proportion in my way of thinking. Because proportion can deaden everything if you just allow it to be this cold system of comparative measurement. But if you say gesture's got to remain present, there has to be a sort of energy or energetic feel in the way the marks behave, how they interact, then you can hold on to the hopefully the best of both of those disciplines again. If I was about to go into measurement right now, I really wouldn't have a problem to move a lot of things around here because if they need to move, they need to move. They're all pretty simple, dumb marks. They're just like boards or sticks. If I see them as an armature and I see malleability as part of what draws me to them, then somehow I'm trying to process through the drawing that having them be mobile is part of the reason why they were created in the first place. I'm trying to locate that line and continually refine it so that Maybe there's an element or an aspect that we didn't see to that or to a great many things that you can somehow discover in spite of the fact that you're dealing lots of times with some of the same questions. Uh, something that seemed to help in pursuing this tonight is relationships I was pulling from over here to there or over here to here or over here to there to try to make more out of that side, which appears to not be as engaged, but I can tell you that it is. There's something really impressive that I'm hoping I'm beginning to capture about the way that this is flowing around, and this is part of it. This arc travels around and lifts up and then drops again, and I think targets that really subtle underside of calcaneus right in through there. So there's there's something about that as the origin of a much longer, more flamboyant brush stroke. This may seem like a really minor mark, but perhaps it's huge in its implication on rhythm, on its contribution, let's say, toward a kind of idiosyncratic gesture in the foot. At least that's the way we want to tune our inquisitive line into behaving. Because if you're sort of sitting there saying, I wonder if that's the little magic mark that's going to give it to me, then it's much better than just kind of drawing and letting your mind drift off to something else and putting it in in a perfunctory way. All this stuff in through here, this is just completely atypical of, of what we would see in through here in a human foot because of the selections that have been made by the artist that was building this up. So that's definitely a reason to have it long term is to investigate that and, and to ask in similar views, what if you made the same decisions? Would you get a more convincing sense of what's going on or what you need to reference this idea. Like how essential is this, in other words? It could be that it makes it, but it could be that it's just too much of a departure from reality to make it work. Then there's this whole foreshortened zone where you're dropping back to that heel and through there and those lines. The great thing about drawing this in front of you and not from a photo is you can move your own eye position over and see where things are traveling. That there's a opening up of this space here as you maneuver your own eye around it, it makes it even more captivating to try to get into the heart of, into the essence of. When you do set it, and it still has openness and breathability, let's say, and you wanna make it twist and turn against what you see is going on, perhaps you're improving it even though you're departing from the reality of the situation. And that's something you should be able to, to feel is part of your right to do as a creative person. To not be too faithful to the optical that it just spoils a good opportunity to make something really profoundly interesting happen.
when you're looking at a form like this one, one of the issues is trying to make it go back so that you can disseminate what's foot and what's ankle or what's anatomical leg and what's foot. And that's why it's nice to go in and make a tonality. This is obviously not a tonal drawing. It's just that that does something pretty effective, but I want to make that apparent because it gets lost on a lot of individuals who study the foot. They don't know how to end the foot. They don't know how to make the foot feel more proportionate. And there is a lot of intriguing stuff going on as one transitions either out of the leg or into the leg from the foot proper, you see. So it's, it's worth thinking about. And I think that's the overall recommendation I have is you're really doing these exercises to reinforce your drawing skills and your abilities in all of that. You're also doing these because you're going to get quite a bit more done when you're drawing from life because of this ability that you're getting by carving out the study of the foot. This is something people just don't do very much of. People tend to leave it out and not really pay a whole lot of attention to it. So I think if you get in there and really dive in, it can be very beneficial for your process. It should be required study. Just keep it in the preliminary stage and you can treat it like clay. You don't have to feel like it's stuck. As long as nothing is truly set, the only thing that you'd rely on more is top and bottom and line of action. And then everything else is sort of trying to amplify the effect, the feeling, to get the feeling to go in. So that's it.